moment. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Find Your Model Health, the official podcast for those looking to optimize their long-term health and weight goals and understand how their body works. I am your host. I am Shemaine Linney. I'm a nutritional therapist, integrative health practitioner, iridologist, and hormone specialist. Sometimes I forget what I even am, <laughs> Morgan. <laughs> so today I have a lovely guest on to discuss what I think is a very important topic right now at this time of the year. We're going to look at self-sabotage, self-love, hopefully have an interesting, insightful conversation. So with that said, please help me welcome Morgan Connell onto the podcast. Morgan is owner of Meta Wellness YYC. Uh, she has a background in business management. She's a certified master life coach, certified yoga and meditation teacher. And she also has an offering for us at the end. Um, she's also a Reiki master, breathwork facilitator. Morgan also is mom of two beautiful girls. She is a wife. She has a passion for ancient wisdom, which is probably why she's attracted to me. <laughs> um, and she likes to interact that ancient wisdom with modern day psychology and neuroscience so we're gonna have hopefully an awesome conversation Morgan welcome thank you for carving out a piece of your day for me thank you for having me this is a privilege this is your first podcast appearance I think with you yeah for sure I'm excited this is gonna be great now this stemmed from um a video you did on your Instagram page, Meta Wellness YYC, everyone, uh, two, three weeks ago, I think it was about yeah, three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and I watched it and it was about self-sabotage. And of course, myself and Morgan know each other. Uh, we crossed paths maybe eight years ago and then we disconnected. And then all of a sudden, a year ago, we connected again. So... I do follow Morgan and I came across this video on self-sabotage and I was like, oh my God, Morgan, let's talk about this. This this is the perfect time of year. September is when I see in my business, every September is busier for me than it is January. This is when people like really want to crush some goals. But as you know, whenever we start a health journey or a weight loss journey or whatever journey it is, building a business, there are going to be some days that are harder than others, but we need to recognize that and what we can do about it. And that's where the self-sabotage and the self-love comes in. So if you wouldn't mind, if you remember, give us a run through of what you said on that Instagram video, and then we can go from there. Yeah, for sure. I think it all begins with our own experience of things. And so for me, I was just speaking to my experience. And now I see this and I have experienced it in various realms within my life. So primarily what I've been working through over the last year is my physical health and just maintaining healthier habits, which you can relate to as well, obviously, with your business and the people that you work through. And so it was just simply putting out that question to everybody is where in your life are you finding that you feel stuck or are you finding that you're not reaching your potential? And generally we find ourselves in those situations because of self-sabotage. So for me, like it takes a lot to work through what those beliefs are that might be driving you unconsciously to sabotage your success. And we can get into that um, a little bit later. But for now, I just want you to start to question or ask yourself, where is it or what realm in your life are you finding that you're limited or that you're settling or that you're not reaching your potential or that perhaps you're staying small? And a big part of my journey is that I've always just had the tendency to stay small, to be quiet, to not make a noise or to not reach for that big goal because uh, lots of different reasons. But, <laughs> but essentially it's why are you staying there? Where is your comfort zone? And how can you break through to get unstuck and to reach that next level of potential to 
reach through that upper limit that you've essentially placed on yourself. A lot of times we tend to blame the external environment or um, people around us for keeping us stuck or keeping us in a certain place, but essentially it's all driven from within and it's all a matter of asking ourselves why perhaps we have a tendency to stay small, to think this way, to hold on to a certain belief and to keep ourselves safe and small. So to even go act a certain way from from my work and you, you know what I do and even in the group one of my well you're in both of my groups but um in my main group it's I'm constantly obviously the nutrition aspect is a thing but I'm constantly trying to help people think like what's stopping you what's standing in your way are you holding yourself accountable do you believe in yourself what would stop you from failing and that's where the self-sabotage in comes in from my from my position where I am now and I'm doing this a, a long time so therefore it's easier for me because it's all it's pretty much second nature at this stage but it's not for new people so when I look at okay where do I self-sabotage well I did something stupid like I stayed up too late watching tv and that ruined my sleep and now the next day I'm extra tired so my cravings are going to be higher or I can get complacent because when you get to a certain skill set you're like oh I can fix this. So then you get complacent before you know it, you've put on a couple of pounds or your skin is broken out. Like, so that's where I see the self-sabotage in myself, but it's, it's both interesting. And if I'm honest, it's hard for me to understand other people and understand why do you keep self-sabotage? Why are you standing in your way? Why are you not taking this action? Absolutely. And the thing is, the, the essential definition of self-sabotage is that you're not going to do something that you know is in your best interest, or you, you have the capacity to make different decision and to act a different way, but you're not doing that. And so we have to question why. And a lot of it can come down to a matter of self-worth and core beliefs. So for example, and I'm not sure if you've covered this in one of your other podcasts, but core beliefs are formed in our childhood. And so a lot of it can come back to reflecting and we don't need to know exactly what happened in our childhood. We don't need to know exactly how we were parented or, or what trauma big T or small T we went through. But we do have to start to get curious about um, what is making us uh, stay small in the way that we know better. We know better, but we choose not to. And generally it's because we're driven by our unconscious brain. So it's not a conscious decision that we're making to perhaps go to bed late and sabotage our success on choosing the right way to eat the next day. But it's a form of habit or it's an unconscious, unconscious decision to stay in that pattern of behavior. And so core beliefs can look like, um, for example, I am not lovable, I am not worthy, my opinions are not valuable. And those can, those can boil down to a root cause of why we tend to act a certain way how our thoughts, our drip, our beliefs drive our thoughts and our thoughts create our happiness and our behavior. And so when you get curious about what is it that I'm doing, what patterns of behavior am I continuously and consistently um, playing out that is keeping me at that weight or keeping me in unhealthy relationships or keeping me at a set level in my career. When I know I deserve better and I have the potential to deserve better, that's where we'll start to make the breakthrough. And I always say in the work that I do with pretty much everybody is awareness is going to be key to starting to understand yourself and then getting curious as to the why and how we can break out of those certain patterns. The mindset is a big part. Our thoughts create our reality. Our mindset is going to be huge, but it's also in creating the action that goes along with this new set of beliefs. So we have to start getting curious, questioning and paying attention to how you act and how you feel and how you think, and then reprogram what that is that how you're going to approach it the next time a little bit better so you even alluded to the fact that it's just ingrained in you now the the way that you think the mindset that you approach most things in your life is just how you operate and we need to look at what is our default mode setting 
Is it to keep ourselves small or is it to get a little bit uncomfortable and start to question what it is that's keeping me there and then use that discomfort as a way to grow and evolve into that next level of who we're, we want to be. We all have this idea of where we want to go and what goals we might want to achieve. But if we keep identifying as that person that is unable to do that, may be developed by those core beliefs that you're holding on to. So I'll give you an example here. I was the fat kid. I wasn't even that fat, but in my family, I was the bigger one of the sisters. And so I got teased a lot for being the bigger one. So in my mind, it's ingrained that I am the fat sister. <laughs> and so I have for years went on different diet plans and I kept healthy. I've always been active. Um, but I've always had a healthy idea of weight and what I look like and body image. And so even when we started working together, I really had to question what it is that kept me sabotaging my success and getting to that goal weight. Now, one of the interesting things is when we started working together, it was, okay, what's your goal weight? And I probably set my goal weight at least 10 pounds heavier than I actually could have achieved. But it was keeping me in that realistic. Now, when we are making changes, there is definitely value in taking small steps and understanding that a change is incremental and we don't need to leap the next day to get the success that we're looking for. But, but where is it that you're saying, okay, this is all I can achieve. This is that box that I fit into this is the identity that I have identified with for 35 years and I'm not going to change so <laughs> we can change and it's about reprogramming our thoughts and beliefs around that and then taking the actions that align with that new version of what you're trying to work towards does that make sense mm -hmm. it's um interesting there's so much self-belief involved oh, yeah. in this but uh when I whenever I do consultations which is all the time and I ask people well, what's your goal weight? Like, what would you like? Um, and I always, before a woman answers or a man, I will stop them and I will say, no, hold on. Like, what would you really, really like? If it was totally attainable, what would you like? Because women have a tendency to undercut themselves. They don't want to seem greedy. They don't want to seem like they're asking for too much, but they don't want to ask for something drastic that's potentially unattainable. Like if you're hiring a professional, it should be attainable because that's what you're hiring them for. But it's the attitude, that self-belief. This, like this whole conversation is so multifactorial. I can sometimes barely get my mind around it. Is yeah. like everything you're saying, I'm like, okay, well, these core beliefs, they're in the subconscious. I don't think a lot of people even recognize they have core beliefs. The trauma yeah. topic is such a hot topic now that I don't even like getting into it, I think. And Dr. Joe Dispenza, who we're both a fan of, he said the same thing that I've been thinking for years recently. And I was like, oh my God, I was right the whole time. He basically said what I've said, like, okay, you've experienced trauma. Yes, it affects you. But is there really any point in digging deep and pulling it up? It's going to hold you back. How is that going to propel you forward? And I've seen some of my clients dig deep on trauma and it's destroyed their life more than before they did. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's not necessarily the awareness of what that is and what that looked like for you, but it's that it's that piece of reprogramming who we are now and how we think and act and behave. And that can also relate to our nervous system responses. So, you know, you look at your, your mindset, you look at your emotional set and how you can work through your emotions now in this present moment, not who you were and what happened in your past. It's like, oh, this feels uncomfortable for me. Maybe it's because I have a fear of success. Maybe that's what's holding me back. I actually don't know what that would look like. And I would question uh, I, I, that I'm an imposter if I actually was successful. So what, what fears are coming up that are keeping you there and how can you work through that emotion to get to that, like build the capacity within yourself to understand yourself better and move through the emotion to get to that next level. And then from a nervous system regulation standpoint, physiologically, what is my body? How is it responding to this sense of fear? And how can I work through that and know that I am safe? 
uh, the beliefs that I may have developed as a kid to keep me safe no longer are relevant as a 35 year old or somebody in your 30s. So as an adult, what is it that I need to feel safe and build the capacity within my body and mind to know that I can move to that next level and that next version of me and who I'm meant to be? You mentioned awareness, which is huge. Um, another thing that I struggle to wrap my head around sometimes I think it's because I'm so biochemistry orientated that when it gets to understanding the psychology and like you've known me for a while I have a certain type of personality I'm very driven if I say I'll do it I'll, I'll just do it so I don't understand people when they say they'll do it and then they won't do it I'm like they, it just confounds me but the self-awareness, like not only being physically aware of how you're feeling, like I talk about with biomarkers, but that mental awareness of why am I doing this or like stopping yourself or talking yourself out of something. Oh, I'm just going to put on Netflix oh, and yeah. then having the awareness to stop yourself. Hold on. Why am I putting on Netflix? Ah. Why can't I just go make a cup of tea and go to bed instead? Like, why am I that that a lot of people they're not aware of their actions. Yeah. Yes, big time. And also, so that's because then their habits and the behavior and their thoughts are driven just by what they, who they've been. And so there's no awareness there. But it's also an idea of, okay, when we are moving or changing, so the, the I've already mentioned before, there's that vision of safety and what it feels like to be comfortable. Nobody likes to feel uncomfortable. And sometimes when you change your habits and you change your behavior and you change your thought patterns, it can feel uncomfortable because it's not natural. So it's going to take time and consistency of changing and disrupting the patterns before you start to feel comfortable in it. So first of all, get used to the, the discomfort of it and of the change. People don't like change. <laughs> so get used to it because change is all there is in this world, first of all. Yeah, soak it up. <laughs> right, exactly. But second of all, that reality, that new reality that you're creating for yourself actually doesn't align with who it is that you've been up to this point. So there's this disparity between who I believe myself to be and who I'm trying to get to become. Um, and, and that, first of all, area of growth and discomfort, but also that mindset of this doesn't, this isn't me. So it's like shifting your identity, essentially, which can take a lot of awareness. Or who and I a lot want of, to be. Exactly. Yeah. I've said that to a lot of people recently believe it or not I've gotten bolder and brasser with what I've been saying to I love it <laughs> now I've said to a few people because um one of the things I've been doing is like I'm taking applications now to work right. with me I'm not just working with anyone because I'm saying to people like you you have to become a different person you cannot be yourself anymore you have to become a new person you have to create a new personality you have to start today working on the person you want to be and knowing that the old you is gone like you can't stay there that but a lot of people never think of it like I have to become a new person yeah. and whether or not my partner or my family likes this new person or who I'm becoming that's yes. on them. I need to do yes. what's best for me. So two things with that. I always say that you can't create what you want by doing what you're doing now. You have to change into that person, to your point. But secondly, a lot of our personality was developed when we were a child. And guess what happens when we are developing our personality as a child, it is not self-focused. It is externally focused. It is how do I keep myself loved and accepted and part of the tribe and what is acceptable to my parents and my, my community. It is not what is aligned with me and who I am and what I am here to do. So a big part of it is not living for the external validation, which we've been taught and conditioned is the right thing to do because it kept us safe for so long. So once again, come back to who you are today in this present moment. And are you living for others and their expectations? Or are you truly aligned with what is right for you and 
and who you want to become. And how does that fit in with your value system? Not necessarily the value system that you grew up in and were conditioned to believe was right for you, which is the is a lot of work <laughs> to kind of dig into, but it's not impossible. And, and you don't need to understand all the ins and outs of it. You just need to know, okay, who is it? How do I want to feel every day? Who do I want to surround myself with? How do I want... Um, my day to look? What are those habits that are going to keep me healthy and in good relationships? And the great thing about kind of shifting into this new reality is trying to understand if you truly believe you deserve it, because if you don't feel you deserve it, you're not going to get there. So that matter of worthiness and self-love plays a big role in developing that um, a sustained way to work towards what it is you believe you want to create in this world. Um, be it through relationships or career in all departments, finances, whatever, whatever. You just need to understand that you deserve it. And how can you get there is through that I am worthy, I have, uh, I am lovable, questioning those beliefs that may have kept you stuck, like we talked to already. And then just repatterning, like with neuroplasticity, we, we can change our habits around thoughts and we can get our body and mind aligned with this is who I am and what I want to step into. And it does feel safe for me to do this. I would add that not only do you deserve it, you are capable you can do it. Yeah. Like we're more capable than we think. Another thing I find really helpful going in line with what you said a couple of seconds ago is how does the person you want to be act? Figure yes. that out and start acting like them today. So if someone wants to be like me, how does Shemaine act? Okay, she gets up, she takes her supplements, she does this, that, she makes sure she works. Like you would start acting like the person you want to be. If you want to be a millionaire, start acting like a millionaire would act. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so true. I talk about this in, in one of my programs. It's like we actually create the identity of who we want to become and then we work backwards and you can make it incremental. It doesn't have to be an overnight change. And in fact, that's probably the wrong way to go about it, but it can be incremental when you break down those goals and, and from an identity basis, not from, okay, what, do, you know, we're always taught to make smart goals. Yeah, that's a good way to approach things, but it needs to come from the level of identity right? Not from what it will look like. What does success look like? Because your version of success might look very different to my version of success or, or fulfillment um, if I'm working towards a new identity and life that I'm trying to create. Mm. And possibly if you liked your current identity, you might not be reaching out to either of us for help. So <laughs> there's that, like, there must be something going on there. Um, <laughs> it's important to have as I mentioned at the start of the week in the group, like sometimes we have to sit with ourselves and have this real talk and it's, it's going to be hard. And it's, it's like, so all summer. Okay. Here's a, here's a self-belief I have had for quite a while. And I've literally only broken it over the summer. This is a crazy self-belief, but I do crazy things. <laughs> so <laughs> I always had the, well, for the last few years, I've had the belief like odd numbers are amazing for me. Every odd number year is an epic year for me. I bought my house in an odd number year. I like my business was the most successful. So then when an un, or like an even number year comes, I'm like, oh man. Oh. So for the first six, it's ridiculous now that I think of it. Love it so for the first six months this year, I'm like, man, this year sucks. Why is this so difficult? Well, I can't wait for 25. It's going to be, so, but I'm only halfway through this year. And then all of a sudden, I don't even know what happened. Something just clicked in June. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, this is all on me. I'm the one that's making it suck. Nobody else is because everything else is the same except me. So yeah. And I, I took a step back and I was like, okay, I'm going to spend the whole summer just working on my self development and inner growth. Now, nothing to do with like science and work. I was really just focusing on my mental health, what I want in life, what makes me happy 
what I don't like, just really a lot of inner work. And I'd never spent that much time. Like literally I took the whole summer, every single day, wash, rinse, repeat. Cause I had that realization I need to change. Like I was going around miserable. I was complaining. As you know, if you're complaining, you're unhappy. You're making yourself unhappy complaining. So I had to work and you know, some days, I was like, oh my God, I'm exhausted. This is so hard. And this is from, a, I leg press 600 pounds. Like I can do hard things. Right. And I was like, man, this inner work, it's like takes so much work. Now that we're into September, I'm so glad. I'm so happy. Like I'm, it's going to be a great rest of the year. I do regret that I ruined the first six months for myself. I have nobody to blame but myself. <laughs> yeah, but the inner work and changing my perspective and really it's, understanding, like, this is all my own fault. I'm doing this to myself. Yeah. Um, and there's no right. reason for me to be negative. Totally. Yeah. So radical responsibility for your life your life is not necessarily dictated by everybody else around you or environmental factors yes they play a role but ultimately you have the final say the final control what you prioritize and essentially happiness the happiness of your life really does depend on the quality of your thoughts and so when expectations can be the killer of everything so if we already have these um these expectations of okay 2024 is going to be a crap yeah guess what it's going to be a crap yeah. <laughs> because what you put out there is essentially going to come back to you so I love how you took radical responsibility for your thoughts and then the other key to your story is that consistent dedication to doing the work Yes, there are going to be hard days, but you're still going to show up and do it because guess what? Those incremental changes, those 1% changes that you make to your mindset, to your physical routine, whatever it is, are going to add up to six months down the road, you're having the best year of your life, potentially. I, well, I feel like, well, I, one, I knew it had to be done. I, I have enough self-awareness that I'm like, come on, like, this isn't your, like, you can fix this. And okay. two, like, it's ridiculous now that I look at it because, like, upon reflection, my bills were paid. I had yeah. business. My kids were happy and healthy. We had went on vacation multiple times. Like, I'm like, why am I being an ass to my, like, I was, I was doing it all to myself. But then what you say is like the radical realization when, when people say that, and this is not to sound like condescending or anything. When someone says that to me, I'm like, well, yeah, that's easy for me because I'm so skilled in this. I've been doing it for so long. You just tell me what to do and I will do it. But for the average person, like that's not easy. No, absolutely not. And and looking at ourselves in the mirror, you know what's interesting? Um, and I'll, this won't make sense. Or like, it sounds like I'm going on a tangent, but it all comes back. Um, I was having this conversation with somebody and it was like, when you are triggered by another person, so when somebody acts or says something that like, oh, that really irks me, you know what's interesting about that is it, it's only because they're holding up a mirror to you and what you need to potentially work on. Mm -hmm. So first of all, okay, we talked about awareness. Sometimes people don't have the self-awareness and so that might take work. It might take a few weeks of kind of journaling or really understanding who you are to build that self-awareness. So if you're not there yet, look at what your triggers are in the external world or with other people, because I guarantee you it's holding a mirror. So anytime you're looking to judge somebody, anytime a certain situation really triggers you, what is it about that situation that's triggering you? Because I bet you that's something that you need to reflect on and maybe work through internally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and I think that one of the biggest you know we're talking about happiness and um I read this study about happiness and one of the biggest findings or more co most consistent findings in happiness studies is that relationships are what are a key indicator of one's happiness so it could you know we think it might be career or fitness levels or um your level of health and wellness and that's all important, obviously, because we want to achieve lots of things in different realms. But relationships is one of those key indicators. But when I talk about relationship, 
I always focus first on that relationship with self because we are so quick to look outside of ourselves for the answers, but it's always within you. And unless you do that in a work where you start to build that capacity for self-love and self-worth, your external relationships are going to reflect back at you how you feel on the inside. So if you can stand steady and in your power and in your true understanding of who you are and what you want, those external relationships are going to reflect that back to you. And you're going to find that true happiness into and externally yeah and I mentioned the complaining was a big thing for me like oh nobody helps me nobody offers to do the dishes oh you just come in and watch tv and I'm left to do everything oh nobody helps me bring in the groceries and I really had to change that I was like so I had heard somewhere, if you complain, you're making yourself unhappy. And I'm like, why am I making myself unhappy again? Have an amazing life. Why? Like, this makes no sense. So then I started changing my mindset. Okay, they won't do the dishes. It's all right. They'll do it wrong. And anyway, so I will just do it. And then it was like, oh, they won't bring in the groceries. That's okay. I need to get my steps up. And I was just changing how I was looking at it all the time. But um. Oh man, I forgot where I was going with that. But what I, what I was going to say is that creating these habits for someone to build self-awareness, um, they're, with the complaining part and being aware of my complaining, part of it was like, also, at, why were there sometimes I was more likely to complain than others? Like yeah. some days are great. Some days, even now I can't help but say, um, it'd be nice if you'd cut the grass, you know, <laughs> and those days I started to recognize those are the days where I'm more irritable because I'm tired. I'm stressed. I need a bit of time to myself. I need to go practice some self-love, take care of myself. Um, and that was going to be in kind of where we were veering this conversation and that self-love part of what I discovered in my amazing I deep dive into all things psychology this summer was just letting go sometimes it's okay. okay like okay like this morning I was supposed to do something for work this morning and I was like you know it's not a big deal I'll do it tomorrow like just kind of sometimes and I said this to a client during the summer because she was asking for some advice I'm like sometimes it's okay sometimes leave the vacuuming till Friday it's fine like who really cares so I, I have to also take on that you have to relax a bit more attitude as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that really ties in with the idea of self-compassion. And I think that we, we're we in this society that's drive hard, do more, keep up. And we tend to work towards um, what it looks like. So yes, we've got a good career. We have, we go on vacation. We've got a beautiful family. And sometimes even when we reach those goals, we don't feel that level of fulfillment and happiness. Mm. And that's okay as well, because we, when we're working on ourselves, we're really trying to find and align with what is, what true fulfillment means for us. And then it also means that we're going to have bad days where we're not reaching our full potential. We're not living up to that expectation that we set out for ourselves. And so can we have that level of compassion? You know, the other day I went and um, I worked out and it was not, it didn't feel great. And I, I remember leaving and saying, I should have pushed heavier. I should have lifted heavier. And then the coach said to me, well, how did you sleep last night? Uh, how did you eat yesterday? Because what you do the day before impacts how you feel the next day. Mm -hmm. And so maybe you're just having an off day. And I know for women, especially it's cyclical, right? We have our weeks and our days where we just feel like overwhelmed with life. And that is okay to just meet yourself where you're at because tomorrow's another day. And maybe tomorrow you'll meet your expectation, <laughs> but where you are today is okay. No matter if you're failing or finding success what is that to you how do you define that and just being gentle with yourself as much as you can we you know another friend said to me the other day talk to yourself the way you would talk to your best friend we do not do that for well, ourselves 
<laughs> unless you unless you're you know, <laughs> raised in Ireland I was saying this to a guy in the gym this morning he's also Irish so we talk and everyone's like hasn't got a clue what we're saying but we were talking about like the infamous c word I'm not gonna say it here but to Irish people it's a term of endearment to call someone <laughs> a c word um but Canadians don't always get it like that but how we talk it, it it is like it's different in Ireland but there's still the loving capacity there's just of more course. swear words in it but it's still <laughs> that loving capacity and when like you said like you, when we're not on top of our game mm -hmm. and just accepting that but you mm -hmm. have to you ha this comes back to your awareness you have to have the awareness like okay. and if you don't have the awareness and you're just beating yourself up all day then you you have to step right back to the beginning you have to create self-awareness and then in that moment where you walk out of the gym you're like yeah that wasn't my best workout like whatever have awareness then you got to press reset and I'm going yep. to start again you don't just wallow there and stay there for weeks you have to reset start again Totally. Because you really have to be aware of the energy you're bringing into the situation. If I'm going to like just keep pushing harder and just keep pushing myself and drilling myself and saying that wasn't good enough, Morgan, where is that going to lead me? It's just going to lead me down that spiral of negativity mm -hmm. versus letting go saying, OK, today Fine. was a bad day. Yeah. Tomorrow is going to be better. Yeah. And you start again. Let's press that. Let's press that restart. But I actually say that with my kids a lot when they're having a moment, you know, like, let's just take a breath, take a break. And then we'll try again. We'll restart. Mm -hmm. Then you you don't, who's to say that like the middle of the day can't be a reset. You can, you can use that as a way to just retrain how you're going to think about yourself, how you're going to approach the situation. And all it takes is two minutes, two minutes of awareness and then a shift in your energy and a shift in the way that you think. Easier said than done. I will, I, I promise you that. But the more you do it and the more consistent you are at implementing that strategy, the more of a default mode it will become. Yeah, it'll become second nature. It becomes just who you are, what you do, like brushing your teeth. Yes. You yes. What you mentioned earlier about the core beliefs being instilled in us as children, with what you know now and your, your pretty much experience and even learnings, how does that influence how you talk to your girls and raise your girls because and we're the man I'm the least perfect parent but we do have awareness when we're in this field of what we should obviously I don't feed my kids certain things we have awareness but also I'm conscious to instill I have two boys you have two girls instill in yeah. them as much masculinity as I can and make sure they have confidence and they understand how to be a good person yeah. and try not worry and not be afraid and stand up for themselves. Like it's a lot of work, but I try to instill more, dare I say more than what they're learning on TV and computers. I try to offset that as much. So how do you do that yeah. with your girls then? Oh, that's a, such a big topic and I love it so much. <laughs> so, so, when we parent, we oftentimes parent how we were parented. So you'll see it play out where a lot of parents don't take the time to get curious with how they react. Now, let's face it. When you're dealing with kids, there are going to be a lot of triggers and there are going to be a lot of impulsive decisions and behaviors because what they sometimes trigger in us is our survival instinct, our fight or flight, and we can get reactive. And so there's definitely, I am not a perfect parent by any means too. And there's definitely been times where I've been reactive, but it's how do we repair that? And how do we wait? I overreacted. I'm going to take on responsibility for this and model what it's like to work through imperfection, not tell them this is what the world looks like. And this is how you show up in the world. It's about helping them develop a sense of who they are within their environment and build the resilience in themselves because they are going to meet, they are going to have instances where they're not going to be liked or they're not going to be understood but are you strong enough in yourself to know that I'm going to have my bad days and I'm going to be imperfect and still I am a good person so the bottom line is I always instill and come back to the fact that you don't make 
the best decision sometimes, but that doesn't make you a bad person. You're still a good person doing the best that you can in this moment. And I don't necessarily speak to my kids in exactly this way, but there'll be examples, right? Where we can pull on and just say, okay, so mommy messed up, mommy shouted, and I really shouldn't have done that. You don't deserve to be treated that way. And so I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to start it again. This is why I got upset. Do we understand that it's mommy's job to keep you safe, for example. So we just talk through those, right? But it, once again, what does it come back to? Awareness and curiosity. Why did I react that way? Because I was told as a kid that that was annoying when I broke a cup and it was the worst thing in the world. So now I, I react and then I have to question, why did I react? That's just spilt milk. Like, Not a what's big the big deal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So questioning why we react a certain way and it's again it's just taking that moment of awareness to understand okay I'm imperfect and maybe model that to them it's not such a bad thing but how do you repair it in the end and always come back to that level of compassion compassion for who they are as children because they're just learning and guess what is their job to make your life difficult sometimes <laughs> and also they are my biggest teacher so when I am triggered, I understand that maybe it's something I need to work to. They're holding up a mirror once again. What is it in me that I need to fix or work through in order to show up as a better mom? And then you're modeling for that essentially just by doing the work on yourself. So hopefully when they come across those examples in real life, because this is the real world and they are going to, that they'll be able to have some a level of self-worth, first of all, confidence. And also a level of self-compassion and self-love to just be like, oh, I messed up. Okay, I'm going to learn from this. This is a learning experience and I'm going to evolve and grow from it. It's that growth mindset, which I'm sure that you've touched on. A lot, a lot of um, parenting, I remind people a lot of this is leading by example, especially when people ask me, oh, my kids nutrition list that I'm like, look, try not to stress about it too much, but remember the kids watch us they might not say it but they watch everything we do and whether or not we think it every step we take we are leading by example that That's includes right. how we talk to ourselves and how we take care of ourselves kids are mm -hmm. learning is like I, I'm I'm sure lots of people don't agree with me but this is mostly my opinion that a child is a prime reflection of the parent. So yeah. like you yeah. look at the child, you can guess what the parents like and vice versa. Sounds a bit harsh, but it usually works out pretty accurate. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I get what you're saying. It's tough. So before we wrap this up, I think we're we're just everything we're talking is about self-love and how we prevent ourselves from showing ourselves self-love through self-sabotage holding ourselves back not achieving our full potential or breaking through that ceiling like you mentioned um and i think if we were to put it all under one umbrella would be that awareness that we've spoke about so yeah. if you're not someone that's either naturally aware or trained to be aware how do you start becoming aware um, yeah. what are some tips like I if you don't mind me saying I believe you should have some sort of visual aid or reminder first thing in the morning to start your day even if it's press play on whatever video it is or pray or you need some sort of reminder to start your day yeah absolutely I love that there's lots of different practices and I always say um you got to find what fits with your lifestyle and who you are but um one of the biggest things so I preach mindfulness till the cows come home because I think if we are able to just instead of live in the past and who we were yesterday or focus on worrying about what will be tomorrow or in six months time, if we can just get really present with who we are today and understand what action I've just taken, what action have I just taken and how is that contributing to what I want to build, right? So we can identify self-sabotage a lot faster if we're just mindful on what we're doing right now today. So mindfulness is a big one. Now, um, we can do that through breathing techniques. We can do that through journaling. So journaling is a huge practice 
that I preach as well. Sometimes I fall out of the practice. Sometimes I come back to it. So again, consistency is going to be your best friend. But even if you take a minute to just journal at morning or night, and if journaling is not your thing, then look to just start a simple gratitude practice. So what am I grateful for today? You know, it's really as simple as that. Like even at the dinner table with my kids, we look, we go around the table and say, what are we thankful for? or it's those little habits that start to build awareness of okay how was my day so I usually do a gratitude practice at night where I can reflect on what I'm grateful for and just get aware of what happened today and then in the morning I look towards setting an intention so how do I want to feel today do I want to feel more energized? Do I want to be um, a more present mom? Do I want to um, feel like I've accomplished a lot on my to-do list? Like, what is it that I'm trying to feel and live today? And then it'll make you more conscious of the actions that you're taking for the rest of the day, just by setting a simple intention. And it could be a feeling or, you know, an emotion or a specific goal or a specific concept but it's just going to start to program you to look for what you're doing in the present moment and reflect on how the day may have gone and how it could do better um Marcus Aurelius I, I, one of his practices was to journal at night and reflect on the day so that first of all it's a it's a matter of congratulations because oftentimes we don't really congratulate ourselves or honor where we are we just always want to strive for the next thing so consciously congratulating ourselves for this is what I did today even if it was like you didn't do much you still got through the day <laughs> and then you can use that as a reflection point for how you want the next day to be better perhaps or how you want to implement a new habit to move towards a specific goal or how you want to show up as a wife or a mother so those simple journaling, gratitude practices, mindfulness practices are going to allow you to just be present with yourself and make those changes incrementally and build that awareness incrementally so that it just becomes natural. Mm. It's, gratitude is huge. I do three things I'm grateful for as soon as I wake up, usually when I'm taking my basal metabolic temperature. So that's how I'm using my time. And three things at the end of the day, they're usually simple, like I'm so grateful for my bed like it's just yeah, simple it. things but it's interesting with your journaling my journaling I do at the start of the day that's mm -hmm. my time but what I do the what why I journal at the start of the day is one I always have stuff to be grateful for a roof over my head but two I journal because I'm creating my day I'm creating mm -hmm. my future so what I'm putting into my journal, it's going to happen. This is what my day is going to look like. I am creating my future. But even that, before we finish, that even I feel, and correct me if I'm wrong, is still because a lot, I have a ton of experience working with people. So I see trends all the time. So going back even further okay, gratitude, journaling, it's awesome. It's a great place to start. Mindful, it's all great. But we're missing a key component here. Your alarm goes off. You jump out of bed. You got to scream at the kids. You got to put the coffee on. What are you yeah. doing to remind yourself to be grateful? To do? Are you setting in a reminder on your phone? Do you, I have tons of sticky notes on my bathroom window. Do you have a sticky note saying, do your gratitude or press play on that sermon or whatever it is like we need external reminders to be mindful and have awareness until we become yeah. aware <laughs> I would say that exactly especially in the beginning when you're building a new habit it's not going to come easily and I actually I recorded a podcast of my own about habit formation there's lots of science behind it um atomic habits is a good book to start with if you're just kind of like entering into the foray of habit building but yes you need reminders physical the physical environment needs to be set up in a way that will aid you in making that change in um in habit and then there's um, techniques like habit stacking so for example you said you do your gratitude when you take your basal metabolic temperature that's habit stacking because you're going to do that every morning anyway like you're going to brush your teeth so for me uh, I do my gratitude when I brush my teeth, when I shower, that's when I ground, that's my grounding practice. So you just, you're going to do things anyway. So what can that's I just pair? good time management. 
<laughs> this is what we have to do as mothers. But <laughs> the other thing is too, is it doesn't need to be thought of as this big practice. What's always been for me, especially a barrier to, to entry for forming new habits is that I always think it's this big thing that I have to account for 15 minutes, which I don't have 15 minutes of time to account for it. So you need to start really small. Like, can I build a mindfulness practice when, cause I'm going to sip my morning coffee. It's just a part of my habit anyway. So I'm going to sip my morning coffee and I'm going to really smell the aroma and I'm going to feel the warmth. Like where can you just simplify and make it a two minute practice? Maybe it's a two minute breath work to calm your body and mind down when your child's just triggered you and spilled milk. So it's like, where can I just throw it into my day where it's not this big deal that I have to now create an entire system or timetable around? It has to be easy for it to be sustainable. And I'm going to add, and we probably should do a second conversation on this because I think we're not nearly finished. We could keep talking <laughs> maybe in a couple of weeks and we'll see how people have progressed through fall. Oh, good. It, it has to be important to you. If it's not yes. important, you're not going to do it. Back to the coffee. Coffee is my me time. The coffee and the journaling, it's like nobody, don't even look at me for those few <laughs> minutes. This is my time because it's important to me. Um, again, easier said than done for me, but it has to be important. And when I was doing the inner growth work all throughout the summer, I started sticking, what are they called? Those sticky pad things everywhere, yeah. like the yellow ones and reminding myself and positive affirmations and just I needed the visual aids because it's so easy for me to jump straight into a science podcast or I have to respond to this client I needed the visual aids and it was taking just a few seconds every morning not as long as people think it does but it's the wash rinse repeat that I always talk about and then before you know it it is just what you do who you are yeah exactly so and and the feeling of accomplishment once it just becomes a part of who you are is amazing but you have to hold on to that why why am I doing that because implementing a habit I mean especially if you're reprogramming yourself after 30 odd years it's not going to be a piece of cake it's going to take into Z and they say 21 days but it's more it's longer actually but I don't want to break most people's bubbles. I do um, it all the time. I'm like, it's it's nothing. There is no actual terminology on how long it yeah. takes because you know what? If you do something for 21 days and on day 22 you stop doing it, you have not created a habit. If you do for 100 days, <laughs> 101, like it's not even the term habits. I don't know. You just have to become that new person. Uh -huh. like, that's exactly that's exactly it. And for me, and like you say, maybe we will continue the discussion later, but um, for me, it's a feeling. It's how do I want to feel? It's not what does it look like or a checklist of this is what I should be doing, because if you're shooting yourself, you're not going to get there. <laughs> so it's how do I actually want to feel? So for me, it was I wanted to be more energetic. I wanted to be more vital. I wanted to show up as the mom that I that I know I could be for my kids. And that's what drove me to make these habits, to change the way I ate, to make sure that um, you know, I'm starting to create this business for myself that really matters to me. You know, it, it goes along with who who do you want to be and how do you want to feel? Mm, and I think underlying everything is just that happiness. Just we all want yeah. to be happy and whatever that looks like for you, that's going to be a big part of your why. Huh. Okay, so we've covered a lot and I really think we probably should do a part two because it's a deep, deep rabbit hole. <laughs> so with the self-sabotage creating awareness remembering to love yourself that love take time relax wash rinse repeat set up some visual aids and everything <laughs> and remember that most of the time dare I say that when we self-sabotage now it's usually because we're stressed or exhausted so you have to reflect on that if I ever see someone give up or make a bad food choice it's like been a busy day or a stressful day at the office or something so we we do have to recognize that aspect as well yeah absolutely that's a good summary well done <laughs> <laughs> till next time so you had an offering first your website meta wellness yyc.com 
Uh, Metawellness.net, yes. Dot net, sorry. And you're also on Instagram. So I'm following Morgan there, everybody follow her. Morgan also has an offering for everyone. It's a free 21 day meditation. So I'll pop the link in the description. Hopefully everyone gets into that. Maybe you should do like a 21 day reminder where you're just going to text everyone every morning. Do your gratitude <laughs> journaling. It's, accountability is key <laughs> you know it really we'll do the rest this conversation another time but it's very very interesting because I've done that I've done the text reminders there's an automated system I'm not sitting down texting everyone all day I've set up the automated system through my website and I've texted people and even that didn't make too much of a difference people were getting three texts a day three reminders so you think okay, that's a, that's next level accountability. It wasn't. So regardless, it all comes back to you. Nobody yes. external can make you do what you need to do inside. Yes, absolutely. That's what, touching on that intrinsic motivation factor, which is a whole nother topic. <laughs> next time, next time. Well, um, this has been awesome. Thank you for your time. We'll arrange another one in a few weeks. Hopefully people found this beneficial. You can reach out to myself or Morgan. We're happy to answer any questions. I'll pop Morgan's details into the description. Thank you, Morgan. It's been a pleasure. You, Jermaine. Always.